Okay, so enough requirements and deployment. Let's get into the actual technology. Hello, I'm Philip Ann Baker, and in this presentation, I'm going to be taking you through the architecture of the mesh and show how all the parts of the mesh fit together to provide a whole. And then in the following uh, presentations, I'm going to drill down into each of the three component technologies of the mesh and explain how those work under the covers. And then I'm going to describe the web service, sorry, the mesh service. And then after that, I'm going to be drilling down further and explaining how we apply the mesh to actually produce applications. So there's quite a bit here. Um, what is the mesh like at the high level? Okay, so the mesh does two things. It manages devices and it manages the contacts with other people. So it's managing private keys and public keys. And that's the basis for any good modern cryptography. So the first thing we need to look at is how do we manage crypto on the actual device? So the way that we do that in the mesh is that every device has a device profile. And this is a set of keys. There's a signature key, an encryption key, and an authentication key. And there's a little JSON document that is signed using the signature key. So this is what we call in the mesh a profile which is a self-signed assertion. There are other assertions in the mesh that are signed with keys that are from a different system. And those are things like device connections and so on. And so we'll come into those later. But this is similar to an X509 certificate, but it is self-signed. And this is providing the axiom of trust for this device. It is something that could be created when during manufacture or it could be created when Alice decides to use this device within a per, her personal mesh and so that is a set of keys that's generated on the device and never leaves it or never needs to leave it you certainly don't need to back up device profiles or their keys or whatever the idea is that if the device is lost well any other device you're going to replace it with will have a fresh set of keys. Okay, so the mesh is a zero trust uh, system. So we've just received those keys with the device that were installed during manufacture. That has the security advantage that they can be bound to the device so that they can't ever be extracted and they can be sufficiently random, all that good stuff. But we don't trust the manufacturer and, you know, a good manufacturer who's conscious of security shouldn't even trust themselves because you know, very few manufacturers these days have absolute control over their entire supply chain. So we layer in a second set of keys when we bring this device into Alice's personal mesh. Alice's personal mesh is the set of all her devices she is managing using the mesh through all her possible personas. And this is a PKI, a public key infrastructure, generated by Alice for Alice's ex um, exclusive use. And the profile also, has the her personal mesh also has a profile. It has a master key, and that is used to sign it, of course. And then it has a series of administration keys, and it's actually the administration key that is used to sign a device connection assertion. What this allows is the type of online, offline key management that has traditionally been used by certificate authorities to manage 20, 30, 40-year keys in the web PKI. So we don't want Alice to have to change her master key. The own, so we only use it for the exclusive purpose of signing an assertion, her, her profile, saying that 
we've added or we've removed an administration key. So it's a really, really limited use that we make of that key. It can be stored offline or in a device that's stored in a safe, whatever. We don't need to worry too much about it being compromised. It's not because it's not something that Alice ever needs to carry around with her. Okay, so the set of devices Alice has connected to her profile. So those are her personal mesh, her you know, digital gestalt, and these devices can now obtain information from one or more of Alice's personas that she might create. And the thing about the internet is, yes, I'm one person, but I don't want everybody who I'm interacting with to interact with me in the same way. So I have different criteria for business and personal. I have within my personal, you know, I might have uh, separate uh, personas for, you know, my family and then my embarrassing hobbies like you know, golf. So, um, so we're going to have an account and Alice can have as many accounts as she likes and each account is cryptographically isolated from Alice's mesh persona. So we have another layer on top here. So I'm only going to draw up one of these uh, personas, uh, sorry, one of these accounts. Uh, I'm not going to draw them all. And they have a profile, uh, an account profile, master key, administration keys again, and the way that because you know keys can be quite long and we don't necessarily want everybody uh who we might want to interact with to know that key even the public part of it we use uh what's called a digital fingerprint a content digest similar to well essentially it's the same technology as pgp fingerprints only we use a modernized version of this called uniform data fingerprint that's a bit more flexible that I'll explain later on. So we have a, an account uh, fingerprint, and it might be M A B five dash four, you know, six seven Q, you know, twenty base thirty two uh, digits going on there. You know, quite a bit of complexity. So, so that's something that allows us to really authenticate this account and differentiate it from any other account that might exist there. Okay, so each device that is attached to the account has a separate set of crypto to operate within that account. And this time it's signed by the account admin key. Okay, why are we going to this trouble? Well, this is to keep each of Alice's uh, accounts separate so that they don't uh, link up together and this is one of the principles that we keep applying in the mesh we have cryptographic hygiene at every possible level we use separate keys for separate purposes so we never use the same key for signature and encryption even if the algorithm allows uh, we never use the same key for, en for encryption of static data and for authentication and key exchange type purposes. So we keep everything isolated and we have separate key sets for each device, for each account. Okay, so there's an awful lot of crypto going on and this is not an architecture that would have been practical in 1995 when I first started working on it. And you know, we couldn't have certificate chains of more than three because they took too long to calculate on a 20 uh, megahertz device, uh, which was the standard back then. So, you know, modern computers, Raspberry Pi, five bucks, can easily do all this crypto. And, you know, that's pretty much the flaw for device capabilities these days, unless you go to constrained devices, which are really constrained you know we're talking about the 8-bit 
and the 16-bit uh, microprocessors. Those microprocessors are, you know, we're talking about, you know, hundreds or thousands of bytes, you know, not kilobytes, you know, not megabytes, you know, hundreds of bytes. Um, and so that's a completely different class altogether. And we are probably not going to be using public key cryptography at all. Uh, or if we do, the device will do it once and never again. So we use a lot of crypto inside the mesh, and I will be explaining the details of that crypto when we come to meta cryptography, which is my way of Web 2.0ing uh, all that good crypto stuff that was developed in the 90s and we've never actually deployed. And so when we layer on these additional keys for accounts and for Alice's Mesh profile, we use meta cryptography and that allows us to do some really interesting stuff, uh, combining keys from multiple sources that allow us to avoid a single point of failure. You can never, you know, if you're familiar with the way that RAID redundant disks work, I mean, yes, you can have as much redundancy as you like with RAID. You know, you can have you know, one backup drive, you can have two, you can have three, you can have four. But, you know, however much failure you have, you, you anticipate, you know, you can always go once further and fail. And so it's the same with the mesh. You know, we replace one point of failure with two or even three. But there's still a possibility if everything fails, well, you're still going to be hosed. Right, so we've got the mesh account. And the other thing that's in this account is a series of catalogs. So we have a catalog of the devices that are connected to the account, which is something that the administration device is going to use. We have uh, a set of the contacts that the user has uh, so that they can uh, communicate with Bob, Carol, and Doug from this device in the context of this particular account. And, you know, there can be a password database and so on. And so each of those ca uh, catalogs or spools are represented in a format called DARE sequence, data at rest envelope sequence, which is kind of like a blockchain-y uh, incremental authentication and incremental encryption mechanism that also makes use of that meta cryptography I, I mentioned earlier. And I'll explain that in a future podcast as well. So we have these uh, catalogs, and the catalogs are end-to-end -end encrypted, and they're authenticated using Merkle tree authentication. And they are replicated across all the devices that have been connected to an account. So uh, Alice's laptop, her, her watch, her phone, uh, her coffee pot, they've all got the set of uh, catalogs that they need to operate as an account in the context of Alice's, uh, sorry, as a device in the context of Alice's account. Okay, so we've got all these devices. Well, how do they synchronize? You know, because Alice doesn't have all her devices turned on all the time. So we're going to have to have some external help here. And that external help comes from a web service, which is the mesh service. Now, a mesh service has a profile, and so do the hosts within the profile. And, you know, we're just reusing the same basic trope that we used before, so that when we're connecting to our mesh service, we can do that using the mesh to uh, establish trust after first use. But we would still be looking to use Web PKI or something of like Web of Trust in order to establish that initial trust with the web service. 
So we still want our extended validation certificates, but we're using the mesh to tell the user this is the service you've attached to before, and so the trusted third party can't compromise either. And this service, you know, obviously a service is going to be hosting multiple accounts and the way that it is architected, you know, a single host should be able to support, you know, a hundred thousand dollar accounts without too much difficulty. And for each account it supports. So here let's have Alice. So if this is example.com, This will be Alice at example. Com. And that is where the authoritative copies of all Alice's database uh, catalogs reside. So when a device turns on, it synchronizes with the, cat the authoritative copy of the catalogs that's held by the service, downloads any changes that it doesn't have, then if it's making an update, it checks that it's synchronized, it check if there have been any changes since, it makes sure that it's not proposing something incompatible, it uploads its, uh, and it uploads its um, proposed change. And this whole process makes use of that Merkle tree integrity checking to digitally uh, fingerprint and uh, the container state throughout the whole process. And that prevents us accidentally uploading uh, data from two sources at the same time and ending up in the, an inconsistent state. We're constantly using cryptography to maintain the state of the DARE, con DARE sequence that uh, underlies the containers, sorry, the con catalogs and the spools. Okay, so at this point I've described the use of the mesh uh, to do all the stuff that would be used for the single mesh user case, you know, Alice at example.com. What I'm now going to talk about is how we use the mesh to communicate between users. And this is important, obviously, because, you know, Alice wants to be able to exchange contacts with Bob using the mesh. She wants to be able to use the confirmation protocol, which is a second factor uh, scheme that I'll explain a bit later. She wants to be able to use the mesh uh, communications to um, establish um, voice, video, messaging type capabilities. And so I'll explain that, but first uh, let's get to a clean board. Okay, so let's move on to the mesh messaging protocol. So we have Alice here, and we have Bob, and Alice has an account, Alice, at example.com. And Bob here is Bob at example.net. Okay, so two different service providers. <coughs> and the mesh messaging enforces a four corner model. So Alice is going to send her messages to her provider and their store and forwarded. So in technical terms, mesh, mesh messaging is an end-to-end -end secure, access controlled, asynchronous messaging control plane. What does that mean? Well, let's break that down. So, first of all, it is end-to-end -end secure. If Alice is going to send a message to Bob, she starts off with her message and she encrypts it. And she signs it. 
So she's encrypted it under the, the public key of Bob's account and she signed it with the signing key of the device that she was using. Okay. So Alice here is now going to send that message to her service and the service will only, the body of the message is always encrypted as far as the service is concerned. The body, the, the, the messaging service doesn't ever see that information. The only things that the messaging service can see are the signature and a little bit of metadata that is added to the message that allows the access control part to work. Okay, so what's the access control part about? Well, spam, messaging abuse, is a problem with email. It's, you know, it's a billion dollar industry now is stopping people abusing the system. So if we're going to have a new messaging scheme of whatever type, we've got to build in spam prevention from the start. And this is one of the main uh, value adds that mesh messaging is providing. So the messaging scheme here, we perform access control on the inbound server. And also, uh, so when the message is received here, we check to see that Alice hasn't been doing something that looks abusive. So we check to see the example.com needs to protect its reputation. And it needs to be able to show that, yes, it's not just letting Alice send out 2 million uh, contact um, messages uh, an hour. And again, this is something that we can come back. To. We don't just need to take examples.com don't need to rely on their reputation we can have cryptographic enforcement of that by tying back the activities of example.com via a Merkle tree and blockchain type techniques so you know we don't have to take people's word for it you know it's minimal trust in the mesh throughout so we perform spam filtering on the outbound service and then we do it again on the inbound service only this time we have a set a database of you know policies that the service has created that have to do with you know, moderating example.com spamalot.com and that type of thing and also bob's contacts database now the service cannot read the body of the entries in the uh, in Bob's contacts database. There's a lot of information that's inaccessible, but the but it's able to read enough metadata from that contacts database that allow it to determine yes, this is a send. This message is from a sender that Bob has has determined is authorized to send him. Um, a particular type of message. So in general you're probably going to allow contact requests from anybody so long as they're not you know not sending out too many an hour and you're probably going to uh, uh, but you're probably not going to accept confirmation messages from somebody unless you know them really well. Um, and so so it's uh, access controlled. It's an asynchronous uh, as with SMTP, this is not uh, synchronous messaging in that Alice and Bob don't need to both have their machines turned on at the same time. It can be uh, near instantaneous, you know, there's no need for uh, Bob to necessarily notice that it took more than a few seconds. You know, it let, you know can a message can arrive in less than a second. Uh, but uh, they don't both have to be have their device turned on at the same time for the system to work. So it's an asynchronous store and forward messaging service. And finally, it's a control plane only. The messages are intentionally limited to 32 kilobytes. Okay, so now you're saying, what, I can't send my Word documents? No, this isn't for sending Word documents. 
SMTP is fine for sending Word documents. The places where we do not have a good solution for messaging are for really small messages and really, really large ones. You, know, you cannot send one terabyte of data in SMTP email, even though uh, many, there are many business reasons why you would want to do that. You know, if I'm editing these videos, I might want to email the rough cut, you know, the raw data, the raw footage to an editor, and I might want to use the mesh to do that. So limiting the control plane to short messages means that the control plane can be efficient and you know it's never going to get bogged down because uh, there's an enormous file waiting to come across. It has real security advantages to do with um, traffic analysis prevention that I'll come back to in a later presentation. And it also means that uh, we can do messages of unlimited size, but not as attachments. That the messages that we send are basically to, from, cryptography, and, oh yes, if you must, you know, a few kilobytes of text at most. Because, you know, some messages, you know, it's just not worth sending something else. So we don't have attachments like we have in MIME. We have detachments. If Alice wants to send a really large document, she's going to put that document on, you know, a file store, you know, her iCloud, uh, OneDrive, Google Drive, whatever, you know, whatever her cloud storage provider is. So the, and then she's going to send a link to that content in the message. And I'll explain later on how the UDF fingerprint format and encrypted uh, identifiers can be used to make that sister situation secure, even though this service that it, the data has been downloaded from uh, you know, may not be a trusted service. You know, this is zero trust all the way down. So we send that message with a detachment link in, and Bob then, you know, if it's one terabyte of data, uh, he doesn't want, he, you know, and he receives it on his watch. Well, he's not going to be running Premiere Pro on his uh, Apple Watch now, is he? No, you use Aperture for that. Uh, so he doesn't want to put all that data on every single one of his devices. Uh, he's going to only download that terabyte of data to the actual single machine where it's needed. And so that's, so actually going to, re reducing the messages to mere control messages of 32 kilobytes actually allows us to send larger messages than SMTP because it forces us to think about the exceptional case in the base. Okay, so uh, I've explained the basis of the mesh. In the next videos, I'm going to be going on to explain the foundation technologies. And there are three new technologies that could be applied outside the context of the mesh. The first of these I'm going to be describing is the metacryptography that we use to uh, split keys and recombine keys in interesting ways that enable the cloud encryption scheme of the mesh and the key provisioning mechanisms of the mesh that get past some what have been some real problems in protocol design for years. After that, I'm going to be talking about the DARE sequence and uh, data at rest envelope format, which is the basis for our catalogs and spools. And that's basically, you can think of it as blockchain in JSON. But no, I am not doing a cryptocurrency here. And there is no initial coin offering. And there will never, ever be proof of work. We do have the same blockchain capabilities. We can finalize the chain, but not through wasting 
0.5% of the global energy consumption of the planet. No, that's not acceptable. And then after that, uniform data fingerprint, the naming infrastructure that we use in the mesh. And after that, I'll explain the mesh service protocols and how those work. So there's quite a bit to come. And if you want it in paper, it's also available on the website, of course. And again, I'm asking for people to help here. I need people to help on the technical side, reviewing specifications, suggesting changes. Uh, you know, if you look at the history of the web, you know, some of the most foundational ideas of the web came uh, from, you know, it wasn't all Tim's work. It was other people who commented on it and had the aha moments that allowed it to be much bigger than Tim's original concept. So I'm looking for help. I'm looking for developers uh, who are interested in building stuff on top of the mesh and also working on the mesh. And most important, I'm looking for supporters who are saying, we want to secure the internet Please do that for us because the more people who are watching these videos, clicking like, subscribing to the channels, that's something I can take to the likes of the Microsofts, the uh, Googles, the Apples and so on and say, look, there's, there's a community out there that wants a secure web. You know, we've got some technology that is at least a proof case that we can do a lot better than we're doing today. You know, let's start taking this seriously and you know, let's move forward so that we can secure the web in the future. Thank you very much for your time. And yeah, again, please like and subscribe. Thank you.